let's turn to Psalm 11. Psalm 11 was uh, written when uh, David was a fugitive from King Saul. And uh, David's friends gave him an advice, well-meant advice, but it was based on fear. And David lifts up his eyes to the Lord in faith. And he trusts to the Lord. What we see in this psalm is the opposing forces of fear and faith. And actually the next few psalms we see all the time two opposing things that uh, are addressed. <coughs> so here it's faith and fear. Verse 1 it says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountains? In the years before David took the throne, uh, he was constantly on the run, hunted by Saul. And uh, at this time, his friends advised him to flee to the mountains. And that advice was rooted in fear. And David outright rejects it. He's saying, how can you say such a thing? I trust my Lord. So, very clear in verse 1, the stage is set for this psalm. But uh, the friends continue uh, with their fear-mongering in verse 2. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in the heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So the friends fuel the fear with a graphic description of the danger. And... Uh, they say they have already bent their bow. In other words, we would say uh, their guns are loaded, their finger uh, on the trigger. Um, they may shoot even secretly, they say. You don't even see it coming. And of course, uh, fearing something that we can't see, um, it, it's, it increases the fear. We've seen this, of course, in recent years with a fear of, uh, of, of a virus that you could not see. And so, uh, if you can't see it, then you never know whether it's there or not. So that's uh, the tactic that the friends used, nothing new under the sun. Um, and uh, they strengthened then their, their argument by saying, what else can you do when even the earth beneath your feet sinks away? There is nothing left to stand on. But David says then in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. David says with so many words, now wait a minute, God hasn't gone anywhere. He's still on his throne. He's still in control and he won't be going anywhere and neither will I. When this advice of fear comes upon us, the only answer is one of faith and one of spending time with the Lord. When we think of our problems, we may be overtaken by fear. When we pray about our problems, uh, the answer of faith strengthens us and gives us new hope. God's throne is in heaven. We easily forget it. We easily think that the kings and rulers, and princes and um, presidents of this world are the ultimate authority, but they're not. They're not at all. God is, uh, God's throne is in heaven, and the earth is merely his footstool. It says in Isaiah 66, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth my footstool. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the throne, interceding for us. David's friends say in verse 3, What can the righteous do? And David says, As long as God is on the throne, there's nothing the righteous cannot do. And he continues. Verse 4, second half. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. There's no need for fear. God sees and God cares. Things may get hard as God is testing his children. But he is in control, and he will take care of them. But he hates the wicked, 
and those that go after violence. And David knows it. And therefore there is no place for fear. Verse 6. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, <coughs> fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. David is confident because he remembers the destiny of the wicked. We see this also in, in multiple Psalms, that he remembers the destiny of the enemy. And um, although that's uh, not an, uh, a nice destiny, um, it is uh, also um, uh, empowering and maybe even encouraging. If the ungodly persecute the righteous, how much more will the righteous God persecute the ungodly? Ultimate eternal judgment will be the portion of their cup, he says. The cup containing the wrath of God, that is something to fear. Jesus dreaded it, and he desired it to pass. But he drank it for us, nonetheless, so that we don't have to. But the wicked who do not accept Jesus will ultimately drink from the cup of his wrath. Now the question is, who should really be afraid? Verse 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. In closing, David remembers who God is and who he favors. It is a testimony of his faith and a reason to not give in to fear. The Lord is righteous and that is bad news for those who rebel against him but encouragement for the innocent the innocent victim who was persecuted god loves righteousness and if we walk righteously we keep ourselves in the love of god and when i say that it is not works people jump to that so easily all the time and then dismiss everything it's not works um, to earn God's love, but it is walking in His will because we love Him. And we can do that, and we can only do that, I would say, through Jesus. He is the one who clothes us in righteousness. In Jude 1, verse 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. It's an instruction. He's not saying you have to work in order to deserve God's love. He says, keep yourself in the love of God. Um, and it uh, should be a no-brainer. This is what you want, actually, if you truly love Him. And when we walk away from God, He still loves us. But when we do so, we don't benefit from that love. We've seen it, for example, with the prodigal son. When he walked away from his father, his father didn't stop loving him. But he himself, he did not benefit from that love at all at the time he was away from his father. So um, that's why it's important to keep ourselves um, in uh, his love. And that is, that is what uh, it says there um, in Jude. His countenance beholds the upright, David writes. And these words, uh, they can actually be translated in two different ways. It can be that it means the Lord sees the, uh, his upright people, or it can mean an uh, upright man will see God's face. And actually both uh, are true. Uh, God shines his face on his people. And not like Big Brother is watching you, but as a loving father who looks over his children with a watchful and caring eye and that is truly a blessing that's why we see these words in what we today know as the uh, ironic uh, blessing uh, in number six verse 25 and 26 the lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift his countenance upon thee and give thee peace the lord lift his countenance upon thee it's the same words and yes, God's people will also see him. In Psalm 17, verse 15, David writes, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness.
And in Matthew 5 verse 8, Jesus himself says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In fact, the desire to behold God is one of the greatest motivations to an upright life and an upright heart. It should be. In uh, Psalm 27, um, famous verse, David writes, One thing I have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of God all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. All in all, when David considers all this, one thing is clear. The advice of fear should only be answered with faith. In the Lord I put my trust. Amen. Amen.